everyone. Um, it's really great to see all of you here. I know it's the end of the day for many of you in Asia Pacific and most of your work days, if you are working, is just winding up. So super appreciate all of you just joining in and let's make it a fun and engaging session. So at any point of time during our discussion, if you feel like asking anything, uh, just feel free to. Um, so I think with that, I'll just uh, hand it back to Millie as well, uh, who can then kickstart this discussion for us. Thank you, Prina, and I'm super excited to get this conversation going with you, Ben. I think it should have happened long ago in person, maybe. Uh, but here it goes, you know, I think what is the one thing that I wanted to know, especially when I read um, your latest post uh, on E27 about uh, explaining your life journey and how and what authenticity meant to you. So tell us how you got started, you know, on this journey of finding yourself and, and what triggered this? Um, I mean, you've been a journalist, you've covered wars, um, you've been a UN spokesperson, you've done so much work in communications. Um, so where did, this whole, where did this whole sense of self begin for you? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Millie, because um, finding one's true self, it's really a lifelong journey. So it, there wasn't one particular trigger which went in my head saying that, you know, who is my true self? Am I putting my true self out there? I think it's really been a discovery throughout my life. But I think a few triggers that have happened, and I'm sure a lot of people on this webinar can relate with as well, have been mostly work related. So I've, as you just very nicely mentioned, I've uh, gone through several careers as a journalist, as a strategic comms person. Um, and I've also worked in some very nice places. And I've also worked in some not so nice places. But the common trigger that I've had in asking myself this question on how to be your true self has been, unfortunately, through those painful episodes where um, I couldn't really bring my authentic self. So I can give you an example, for instance, when I was a journalist, I started off in India uh, with a very large television station. I was interviewed by one of India's most well-known journalists at that time, Barkha Dutt, and she had offered me that job in a spur of the moment conversation that we had. And I took that decision to come back to India. I was living in Dubai at that time um, and decided to give broadcast journalism a go. I had never been a broadcast journalist back then. Um, and I knew that there were a lot of skills that I had to learn on the job, um, which, you know, about two years into that job, I felt very comfortable with myself. But I also made a transition into another station, which gave me a bigger opportunity, but which brought along with it a lot of challenges in terms of the people that I was working with, I love my job. I love the stories that I was covering. I was looking at the worst and the best of humanity. Um, but I was also struggling a lot internally about the way I was asked to be perceived. Um, you know, as, as a woman, you're always, you always need to be either seen as somebody who goes with the tide, uh, who doesn't speak up, who doesn't challenge the status quo. But in my case, I did that frequently. And I'm really happy I did that. I can say that 18 years <laughs> since then. Um, but back then, it wasn't really uh, appreciated by the people that I was working with. So I was constantly made to feel that I didn't belong, that I was given a job uh, for which I was not qualified for, I wasn't pretty enough for, I didn't have the right voice. And at that moment, in that particular period of time, I just decided to sort of push those feelings aside and just get on with the job because that's what was required to do. But as I progressed into my career in different places, I noticed that the effects of those comments, of those snarky remarks, still remained a lot with me. So I think that was really the first trigger into asking myself, who is it that I am, instead of who is it that trade on the journalist is, um, who is it that I, the colleague is, the team player. So, you know, unraveling your identity, especially in your workplace, I find it to be an extremely challenging task. And, not everyone will accept you the way you are, but I, I've come to this realization that the more honest you are with yourself and with your internal compass, the more people will see who you truly are. And I think it takes a lot of time. It just doesn't come in the spur of the moment. Um, it takes a lot of time, but once you get there, trust me, it's the most fulfilling thing that you can experience. So that's, that's what the first trigger was. Right. I think that is true that when you say, you know, it come, it doesn't come at the spur of a moment. It's, it's an ongoing process. And I think um, just going by what I read about you uh, in your latest post, uh, you've sort of had so many different experiences, right? Like life, right, being uh, bullied in school and, and, and you're so vocal about most of these experiences. 
just mentioned. How do you think you uh, did that? And how do you think we all as people can overcome these painful experiences uh, and actually emerge stronger? I mean, use them to our benefit. Yeah. So I, I, I think your voice was breaking up a bit in there, but the gist of it I've understood. Um, yes, I have been, uh, trust me, believe it or not, I was a very shy kid in my childhood. Uh, I grew up in a house full of boys. Um, so I always had to either have the loudest voice or the, the biggest punch, you know, whichever worked in that moment. So I think um, that aspect of my childhood was brilliant. Right up until high school, I thought I could achieve everything I set my mind to. But unfortunately, as it happens with a lot of us in high school, we change friends, we change our social circles. I was bullied quite a bit. Um, I was bullied because I, again, you know, didn't um, want to remain with the st status quo. I wanted to sort of carve my own path. I wanted to not just listen to the ideas of the socially powerful, but actually just sort of have that voice or an opinion of your own. But unfortunately, in my case, it didn't work. Um, I was in a group of friends at that time where I fell out with one of them and then became ostracized all throughout my high school years. And I think now that I look back upon it, I can actually freely talk about it, but it really did hurt a lot. And it continued on to my experiences in my professional life, in my personal life. Um, but it also has, I know it's such a cliche to say this, but it has made me stronger as well. So now if I see in my current workplace or in my even in my past workplaces where I've worked in, if I saw anybody being bullied or harassed or discriminated or intimidated, I would be the first person to raise up my hand and say that this is unacceptable behavior, this should not be done. Has it worked always in my favor? Unfortunately not, because speaking out against the powers to be, um, while it takes a lot of courage, it also takes a lot from you, especially if you're going to be a whistleblower and sort of call that out on the organization. So I've experienced that negative aspect of speaking up, but I can say it now with the support of my family, with my friends, and I'm sure with a lot of people who are listening in as well, um, you will get through it. And there's, there's certain strategies and tactics you can use anytime. Anyone tells you that you can't do X, Y, Z because you're not qualified or you can't make an investment pitch to an, entre uh, to an investor, um, you just need to tell to yourself, and I did this just before I came on to the webinar, I looked at myself in the mirror, I said, you can do this. Believe it or not, I was really nervous of doing this as well. Um, and always have that one person in your life or two people in your life that you can call on and just ask for advice. So in my case, it was my niece, Shivani, who I'm hoping is on the webinar as well. And I literally just asked her, I said, you know, I don't think I've got this. Um, I don't think I should be doing this. And she just showed me in a different perspective. So I think a lot of times as entrepreneurs, as founders, as professionals, even as parents and caregivers, we always have self-doubt. There's nobody who's perfect. So accepting that there is going to be self-doubt along the way, accepting that there will be challenges, not every day you can give yourself 100%. We're all not you know, self-motivational gurus here. We're just people trying to get on with our lives. I think just accepting that flaw in yourself, that you're human, that you're not perfect, that you will do the best that you can, um, and setting that standard for yourself has really helped me in my journey. Um, and I hope that it helps a lot of other people who might be listening in. Um, but that's really what I do. I just, you know, I, I tell myself I'm doing good. I check in with positive friends and family, and I accept myself the way I am. It's taken me a long time to do the latter, um, but it, I'm getting there. Yeah, I think it's very valuable that you you put in the aspect of, you know, having a support group or, and in your life to be blessed with Shivani and others. And I think that's such an integral um, understanding that we're all evolving to, right, especially when we speak mental health and a lot of these other challenges. So before we, I want to get on to like strategies and how do we get to these, um, you know, elaborate a little more on how do we get to the more authentic side of ourselves. But there's this question around, um, especially when we spoke about bullying and painful experiences and uh, someone from our um, chat has this question about how do you get over the fear of being labeled as a social justice warrior when trying to speak up against bullies? Um, is, right. I, if you want to take that right now. Yeah, sure. No, I think that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. Whoever's asked that question that going against the tide, um, you've 
got to be really careful. You have to pick your battles. That's how I've done it in the past. If it's been little things of um, little things that you think can you can let go by through your internal compass, then that's fine. But for me, I think the bigger question is when my values are put into question by what I'm witnessing. So if I feel that some injustice is being done, and I'm, I'm, you know, I am accused of being a social crusader all the time by my friends and family. Um, but if I feel that certain things are not going according to my values, I do speak up. But now I speak up a little more diplomatically and a little more tactfully. Um, I'm not saying that I'm compromising on my values by doing that, but I am just sort of speaking it in a language that other people would understand that you've got somebody else's back and that you wouldn't be, you wouldn't appreciate that other person being treated the way they are being treated. So I think just having that respect and having that respectful tone that you do respectfully disagree with the way somebody is treating somebody else goes a long way. And having studied bullies, um, you know, mandatorily, not by choice, uh, by experience mostly, I've realized it's all about the power equation. So the more you show yourself as weak, the more bullied you will get. But the moment that you sort of rise up and let them know that this isn't acceptable to you or to somebody else, I think that speaks volumes and that's when they withdraw and that's when they figure out that it's not going to work on you or the person that you're trying to defend. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Prana. I think I'm just going to continue the swing a bit more because we have Sarah in the audience. I think it's, it's not relating it to uh, every day. And she says, when I gave my talk two years ago, um, there was a lot of self-doubt and it was one of the hardest things she ever did. Uh, but she's also a new mom and feels like uh, she has to prove a lot more to her daughter. Um, I mean, she says, if that makes sense, I mean, I guess you probably relate to it a little differently too as a mom. Um, so she says, how do I let that go, or let go of these doubts and of what others think of me, uh, especially even including her own daughter? Hmm. I'm not sure if I've lost you, Millie. Are you still there? Uh, yes, I'm uh, sorry. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to sum it up again a bit. So this is Sarah's question. And, and she says that she gave a TED talk two years ago. And she has a lot of self-doubt and it was one of the most things she did. But now she and one finding thing is how to keep proving uh, it to her, you know, that, that she has this big reality. And I guess it's all guilt that most uh, women mm. and especially women as mothers feel. The question mm. is around how do I let these doubts uh, mm. of what others think? Mm. Yeah, no, I think first of all, Sarah, I mean, kudos to you. Doing a TED Talk while you're a new mom is not everybody's cup of tea. Not everyone can boast about that. So really, I mean, congratulations. That's a huge achievement. And I completely relate with it because uh, I'm not a new mom. My son is about two and a half years old. He's turning three soon. But I am wracked by that guilt every single day. I kid you not. Even after two and a half years of his birth, I do feel that as a mom, as a working mom, um, I do have to work incredibly harder than a lot of other people by choice. Um, and I think there's no real answer to how do you overcome that self-doubt. Like I said earlier, you know, nobody is perfect. I think that's the first realization that I had, that in my mind, looking at social media, looking at all the great curated lives of everyone that I know of, made me feel bad about myself. So number one, I just told myself, they're not perfect, you're not perfect. Um, and once, and it's taken me a, a long time, to be honest, it's taken me, um, it's taken me meditation sessions, um, several introspection sessions where I've really asked myself, what is it that I truly want in life and who do I want to be surrounded with? Um, I've done, I've started working out quite a lot, which impacts a lot about how I feel on the inside as well in a good way. Um, and I think from a practical standpoint, like working on your fitness, especially as a parent, um, while you might think is taking it away, uh, you know, the time is taken away from your child, it's extremely important for your physical as well as your mental health. And the more philosophical aspect of it is just realizing that you're not perfect. Everyone else is struggling in this life. Uh, there's a great Indian spiritual proverb which says that, you know, everyone is in that same boat. 
Um, it's in Punjabi, so it doesn't come out quite nicely and beautifully as it should, but the essence is that you're not alone in this. Um, and just some practical tips that I did as a journalist and which I still do right now, in fact, just before I came onto the webinar, I did a few breathing exercises which calmed me down. I also looked at myself in the mirror and really truly just saw myself as me. What is it that I bring? What is it uh, that makes me me? Uh, as cliched as that sounds. And that just gave me a boost. And as a working mother, it's incredibly hard. There's no sugar coating it. So well done to you for the TED talk. And I think it's just a lifelong journey of accepting yourself and just some of the practical tips that I spoke about. Yeah, I think through that, Marina, it's more about understanding that it's a lifelong journey and then we all have to be at it. Um, I just wanted to mix it a bit, right? Like we spoke about a domestic situation with Sarah and, and Shagun also, what a, she brings this interesting perspective on how do we then become adaptable, right? To different uh, situations and environments. Like sometimes the struggle of being yourself can be at home uh, and then similarly likewise at work or, or something else that you're pursuing. So how does that uh, work out? Yeah, so I think that is one of the main conundrums that all of us working professional face, that how can you be truly comfortable in your skin, yet also looking at what's, um, what's adaptable to the environment that you're in. Um, now, when we all think about authenticity, and it's very fashionable to think about authenticity, I think really the big thing for me is being true to yourselves in an artificial environment where you aren't sure about yourself. Now, this could be a new workplace, an investment pitch you're making to an investor, or even just you know, sort of going on that first Tinder date with somebody. Um, I think putting yourself out there is the first step. I think just overcoming that barrier of fear about what other people might be thinking about you um, makes you that much more agile in adapting to your new environment. And I've suffered from not putting myself out there. I've had some very difficult experiences, which I still sort of, um, you know, when I think about them, they were very painful and very difficult to get over with. And we just need to accept that, like it or not, we do have different masks that we put on in our day. Uh, we might be the parent, we might be the employee, the team player, the colleague, uh, the founder, it could be anything. Um, but I think just staying true to yourself, your internal compass, uh, checking in with yourself. What is it that I like about this particular situation? So it just means being very mindful about the situation that you're in and just taking back what you enjoyed from it and what you didn't can help you sort of adapt a couple of those masks in a way that's actually authentic for yourself um, and not really faking it. Um, but I completely agree with Shagun. I think it is, um, it is extremely contradictory to say that you have to be authentic, um, but in such different artificial environments like the workplace or in other places. So if I just reflect back on it, just be kinder to yourself, think about what worked in a particular situation, what didn't work, and just really adhere to that. Right. Just moving on to this, you know, we started on speaking about these practical uh, to dos and we spoke about the breathing exercises and just getting being more kinder to oneself. So we also had this question from a, our E27 Telegram channel and someone wants to know, uh, what are these inspirational sources uh, that they can use that provide them with stronger values and reinforce their belief in themselves? And, and I'm guessing for you, it also comes uh, from your experience. It could be a book or it could be something that you've experienced in your life. So would you say there are some strategic um, sources that you tap into? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you can gain inspiration from everything in life. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a book. It doesn't necessarily have to be a particular situation. I think it's in the everyday. Um, for me, uh, you're absolutely right, Millie. I have had the privilege of traveling to many different places as a journalist. Um, and as a UN spokesperson. And I have seen the best of humanity and I've also seen the worst of humanity. And an example that I keep coming back to is uh, when I covered the Darfur conflict um, and when I traveled to the refugee camps in Niala uh, in Sudan, uh, which is um, along the border with Chad. And when you actually listen to the stories of the people of the refugees who've lost their land, their homes, their families, uh, women who were raped repeatedly by armed militia groups, children who are now orphans because uh, both their parents have been killed by the same groups. Um, I think 
it just made me realize how good we actually have it, as sad as that sounds. Um, we do complain a lot in our everyday lives about how the internet doesn't work, for instance, first world problems, classic, Wi-Fi doesn't work, uh, data doesn't work. But when I think about the times when I visited rural Assam, rural Kashmir in India, uh, Sri Lanka, Tibet, I mean, countless places where people are just really getting on with their lives with the least amount of resources available to them, it makes me feel very lucky and privileged to have the life that I have. And B, it makes me realize how much more we need to also give back, if that makes any sense. So I think inspiration for me really just comes from having that perspective that it's not just me who's going through a lot in my privileged life, quote unquote, but there are people out there who are really struggling. So I also did a documentary on the Syrian refugee crisis um, for which we had to travel to uh, Greece um, and we visited the Edomini refugee camp. Um, and it was just terrible because, you know, you would have every minute the stories would be the same. People have lost their homes in bombings. Uh, the, the government has been shelling their villages. Uh, they had no choice but to make these perilous journeys on boats, uh, which couldn't really keep more than five people, but 50 people were stuffed on it. And again, that was a turning point for me because I was also at a stage in my life where I had moved to Singapore, where I wasn't quite happy with where I was uh, professionally. And I kept looking back instead of looking forward. So I think that's the change that I saw when I became inspired from different things, from these two incidents, at least. I started looking forward. I stopped looking backwards because I realized that's what a lot of people have to do to get over a lot of painful experiences and to move on. So go find that inspiration. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a refugee camp, clearly. Um, it could be on a walk. It could be spending time with your loved ones. It could be uh, just cooking. It could be dancing. Whatever tickles your fancy, I think. Go find that and get some perspective on life, on other people's lives as well. Yeah, I think that that's a very fair point, right? Like we fail to keep, I mean, we sort of victimize ourselves at most times, even if it is for smaller things, even if it's a very failed, I think the other chat gets stuck in this, whatever we not move and then look at it. Pick up your seem to get stuck there. And says, you know, would you, what would you suggest somebody who's going through a difficult time professionally or personally at this point uh, can really do? Yeah. So I think um, you were breaking up a bit there, but I think a couple of things that we can do when the going gets tough um, is to, I keep coming back to this concept of perfection because. I think a lot of people, especially in the kind of work that we're in and the kind of countries that we're living in, um, our identity is defined by the work that we do, I, I would say at least for 30 years or so. And then comes retirement and with retirement comes that feeling of now what? So I think one is to really remove yourself from that situation and really detach your identity from the work or the workplace situation that you're going through. I can personally talk about one incident which still harbors very heavily on my mind and that's with, um, with an employer which, um, where I was getting severely bullied. I'm not going to mince any words about that. I was put in a team which was highly competitive, um, where there was no team spirit, where it was every person for themselves. And I really did feel that at the lowest ebb of my professional career in that place. Um, I found myself to be burnt out every single day. I hated going into work. I hated seeing my son more significantly. I wanted to just sit on the couch and watch Netflix. And it was much later that somebody had told me that I might actually be going through symptoms of depression caused by work stress. So I think for me, that was really the lowest ebb of my professional career. And the way I managed that um, was I took time out. I took a break. I decided I did not want to be around the people that I was tasked to be around. I went on a solo journey by myself, which I'd never done. And I trust me, it that was the best thing, the best gift I could have given myself. 
three days of being on your own, uh, introspecting what is wrong, what is good in your life, appreciating the good, removing the bad, um, really helped me. And that journey went on for about three months where I essentially took care of myself. My family was there with me. Um, they essentially refused to give me my phone um, lest I look at any work emails. Um, and they also just essentially told me to do whatever it was that I wanted. And I had never given myself permission for doing that earlier. It was all work, 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 and nothing else. And I think for me, that's the biggest realization that you are not what you work as, you are you. And you know you the best that you can. So if you try and impose this version of reality that you're working for a cool company, that you've got all the bells and whistles, that everybody else thinks that it's, it's great where you are, I think internally, if you're unhappy, you've got to make that choice for yourself. And I'm glad I made that choice because I am so much happier. So if any of you are going through, and I hope none of you go through that situation, but if you are, then take some time off and really just take care of yourself. Self-care, self-love, that's what you really need. Yeah, I think you made a very interesting um, you know, point there. We're not who, who we are just at work uh, all the time. And I guess, I, and I do really hope that nobody is actually going through a difficult time as you did, uh, that makes them question everything and especially who they are, right? Um, that also makes me think if, if work-life balance is, is real, like is it even a thing or, or these days are we just all about work? Uh, and if it is, then and how are we living it? Or is it all about taking these longer breaks and you need that solo uh, trip all the way uh, to cut off from your phone fully to feel this way? Yeah, so I, I think work-life balance honestly is a myth. Uh, and it's a myth that's being propagated by people who either have all the resources at hand, who have the help at hand, um, or who by workaholics. I'm just going to be very honest. Um, but I think there are ways that you can actually sort of manage that um, in your favor. For me, for instance, I moved workplaces and I'm now in, an, in a workplace that is so supportive. Uh, I've switched jobs very recently, just last week. And my new workplace uh, encourages working from home, encourages uh, flexibility, something which I haven't really been used to earlier. So I think it is a myth, but it is really about managing a, your expectations of yourself, and B, more importantly, I would say, is managing the expectation of others around you. I've always been a people pleaser, um, and I've, I, I suppose it's also because I've been bullied in the past, so my self-esteem really wasn't very healthy for a long time. So the only way I thought I could be accepted is if I said yes to everything, and for a long time during my working career, that's what I did at the risk of being burned out many, many times. Um, but I think that is really about managing other people's expectations. So I know it's very cliche to say no, uh, that saying no is probably, you know, the hardest, but I've learned that saying no is probably the most empowering, resilient thing that you can do for yourself. And the other bit is, of course, just being surrounded by the right community, the right tribe. Not all of us are lucky enough to have our family in the same town that we're working in. Not all of us are lucky enough to have uh, help at home to take care of our kids while we're away. And those of us who do, then we should feel very privileged about it. Um, but I think just realizing that it's not just about leaning in, it's also about just recognizing that it's not in your hands to make sure that you're the best worker, the best wife, the best partner, the best mother. I think laying, society does sort of lay out all these expectations on our shoulders. And if we fall short of our own standards and the expectations laid out by others. I think we're doing a massive injustice to ourselves. So the, sh the short answer is yes, it's a myth. The longish answer is manage it in a way that your internal compass enables you to, and also in a way that you feel comfortable in taking on that workload or taking on that personal life load as well. Meli, are you still there? Okay, so I think we've lost Millie. Um, and oh, it's, so it's, much sorry, Meli, you're back. Hello. 
Hi. Um, so, hello. Yes, Millie, I can hear you. Uh, okay, so I was just sort of intrigued to know how being a woman, if that's been challenging. And we also had this question from Namita, right, uh, about the imposter syndrome. Uh, did you dread it or if it ever happened, did you deal with it or how would you suggest one would deal with it? Namita, can I please just say thank you for asking this question because I absolutely dread this imposter syndrome because I have suffered from it consistently. Um, and I did suffer quite a bit of it in one of my recent workplaces where, you know, this entire propaganda of how you are the best uh, person to have joined the organization, the organization is the best that you can be in, just added on to that pressure, uh, both in your mental headspace as well as physically as well. So yes, absolutely, I've, I've experienced it many times. Uh, I think the first time I, I experienced it was when I was a journalist and I was doing my first live report uh, for an international news station. Um, and I remember just before I went on air, which is when the recording started, my cameraman at that time, uh, this gentleman who was about 15 years older than me, told me, oh, you look really ugly in that, by the way. Um, and you've just come in from another station, which isn't so well known. So just be lucky enough that you're here in front of us and in front of me. That's, that's the kind of workplace scenarios I've been in. And just imagine just five seconds before you're going to give your first broadcast report to millions of viewers, somebody tells you that. And um, the only way I got over that was by having a shield. It's literally having that superpower, that Superman shield around you, that invisible shield that no matter what somebody tells me, I am not going to take it on me. This is not about me. This is about the other person. Whatever insecurities the other person has, um, he's, he or she is probably projecting it on me. So this has nothing to do with me. That's number one. Number two, I think everyone feels that imposter syndrome at some point in their life. So I think just recognizing that there are other people in the journey who are doing it. And I've noticed, uh, I'm very thankful to the people who've been sharing their personal stories with me through my articles that I've been writing. And it makes me realize it's not just me who went through all of that. It's, it's a lot of people out there. The only difference is that we're not talking about it, which I think is a true injustice for you know, the younger people who might be entering the workforce, who can sort of learn from the experiences that some of us had. Um, so yes, I think the only way that you can get over the imposter syndrome is not by working yourself to death, um, just by really taking some time off and telling yourself what's good about you. Just make a list, like the top five things I love about myself in my personal life, the top five things I love about myself in my work life. Um, and also keep a journal, like I've started doing that uh, just about eight months ago where you, whenever you have feelings of self-doubt, whenever you have feelings that somebody is trying to really rib you and get you out of your comfort zone in a bad way, just write it down. You know, write it down and ask yourself, how am I feeling at this point of time? And do whatever it is that makes you get out of that situation. So for me, for instance, if I've had in the past a really bad one-on-one -on -one with a manager who was very unsupportive, who didn't really care about um, the work, she really cared about, you know, the popularity contest that we had at work, I would just take a walk for 20 minutes. I would walk out of that room, I would just walk out of that building, take a walk, breathe in some fresh air, um, get some perspective on life from myself or call a friend if that's what you want to do. And then I would walk back into that building with my head held high and knowing that it's not me, but it's actually her. So I hope that helps. Just some practical tips on how I managed to do it. Thank you, Prana. Um, I think I like this, uh, the fact that you mentioned younger, right? Um, especially for people who are starting out their professional journey or someone who's just graduated. Um, how did they sort of feel the sense of confidence? I think that's Jaren's question too. Um, when they're not professionally or personally there yet, or even just, just beginning uh, their life on that aspect, how do they feel yeah. confident? Yeah, so I, I totally get that as well. Um, the only way that I sort of overcome, overcame most of my fears and insecurities was literally just to go out there and do it. So for instance, I was never, I'm, I'm still, I'm still not a natural networker. I'm not the person in the room who's going to go spend two minutes with each person and then sort of 
um, then decide strategically who I want to talk up next. I'm more of the one-on-one -on -one kind of a person. I'd like to know each, each person on my team, for instance. Um, I'd really like, I'm curious to know about people. So I think for the younger ones out there, if I were to, to talk to my younger self about 15 years ago, I would literally just tell her, as I am telling you, Jaren, as well, um, that just go out there. You've got something special. You've got something really unique to offer to the world. Don't let people's prejudices or judgments affect the way you think about yourself, because clearly, you know, you have a lot to offer. And for, for the longest of time, I wasn't comfortable with public speaking. I never thought I would be a broadcast journalist in my wildest dreams. I was not your typical extroverted personality at all. But the more you do it, the more you practice something, the more you get better at it and the more comfortable you get. So whatever it is that scares you, whether it's a networking event, whether it's a cold call for an interview, whether it's just sending a message on LinkedIn to somebody that you look up to, just do it. And, you know, I keep coming back to my father's phrase all the time. Um, he keeps telling me in Punjabi, which he still does even after all these years, um, that what's the worst that could happen? Um, you call up somebody for a job, what's the worst that could happen? They'll say, no. Is that the end of life? No, it isn't. What's the worst that could happen when you make small talk with somebody at a networking event? They might not want to be in touch with you. So what? Does it make a difference to your life? So whatever it is that makes you fear something, try and confront that fear. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And take it from me, from somebody who never loved, liked cameras, who never liked speaking, um, and who's doing this right now, I think you can also do that. Yeah, I think that's, that's quite commendable, Prina. I mean, I didn't know this about you, but it's amazing that that's, you don't call yourself an extrovert. Uh, but you're so good with people or even uh, just narrating your own story. So kudos to that. Um, I'm also starting to, uh, you know, feel that all of the self doubt and fears that we all harbor in ourselves about, especially about ourselves, um, they somehow stem or, or have this role to play in this mental health aspect. That, that's something that we're all thinking so much about deeply these days. Um, so Kriska also brought up this question about, uh, how, what kind of a role do organizations play or employers play when it comes to managing mental health at work or even some, considering something like mental health leave? Uh, would you have any thoughts around that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, huge thoughts on that, actually. I think um, nowadays organizations have an even bigger obligation when it comes to supporting their employees uh, with mental health issues. And especially if the organization has been the one that has induced that mental health condition in the first place. So I think it's very sexy to talk about how you need to bring your authentic self to work, how people will be accepting of you the way you are. But if the organization doesn't support that in practice, um, that's basically a lot of uh, diversity and inclusion uh, propaganda that is being thrown at you without any kind of support. It's sort of the analogy that I can think of is somebody telling you uh, you've got to swim in the deep end of the ocean, but without giving you the props to actually swim in that ocean. Um, so I, I feel organizations, especially now, and you know, some of the more sexier names, some of the more bigger names, they keep talking about it. But when it comes to actually supporting their employees, they lag really behind. So for instance, burnout is a common problem, which um, induces depression in some people. It induces um, other kind of illnesses, physical illnesses in people. And the more we recognize that as even employees um, that we do have rights, uh, the more pressure there will be on the industry, whatever industry that you're in to actually act on it, especially if it's the industry that's burning you out. So uh, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer that organizations have a huge role to play in this. And if they don't, well, they need to be held accountable. Yeah, I think that is fair, that it is something that we all as a community, um, employer, employees uh, at home, and our wife to start considering and making space for in our lives in, in terms of addressing it, right, for each other. Uh, we're sort of still, we have about 10, 15 minutes, 10, 12 minutes. Uh, I was thinking if, if it's a good time for us to start summing up so many things that we've now touched upon and spoken about uh, in terms of, you know, what now this authentic true self that we're all trying to uncover uh, is and, and those practical tips that you've sort of slipped it in here and there very nicely. If you could all draw it all uh, back 
so that people have some time to cool off and then think of some other questions that they might have to come up with in the next 10 minutes uh, before we all wrap up. Sure, sounds good. Yeah, no, I think um, when you really think about some of the more troubling issues um, that you're facing at the moment, especially in your work life, because uh, a lot of us are working professionals, even in this conversation right now, I just use a couple of practical tips. If I'm going through a really troubling episode at work, number one, picture yourself 15 years from now. Um, once you picture yourself, you ask yourself, you know, to that person, to yourself 15 years from now, how did this moment or situation impact me? Now, if it's trivial enough not to be remembered 15 years from now, then it's probably not worth stressing about right now. So that's one situation that you can sort of tick off your mental, um, mental worries to do this. Um, the other thing is really, and I've struggled with this and I've written about this quite a bit, is challenging your inner critic. Um, I've had a massive inner critic, which might have been induced by the years of bullying that I went through, um, where, you know, whenever I think I've achieved something in my life, that, that inner critic keeps coming back and tells me I haven't done anything, that I still need to do a lot more to prove to others that I am good enough, I'm a great professional, etc. So when you, if you are facing something similar, when you hear that voice of self-doubt creeping up, really just challenge him or her and tell him that, you know, or her, that I've got this, thank you very much, um, and stay away from anyone who actually brings out that inner critic in you. So for me, in the past, it's been some really bad managers, um, some really bad personal relationships. So that's really been one of my other strategies. The third is really just, it's again, very cliche to say that do the best that you can without beating yourself over it. But I truly believe in that ethos. We all want to be the best professionals, the best parents, the best caregivers, but we're also human. So you need to really cut yourself some slack, give yourself some love, some kindness. Don't look for that love and kindness outside, either in your workplace. And you know, if you're not lucky enough in your personal life as well, it has to come internally. It has to come from you because most of your answers are inside. It's not outside. The outside just triggers what's going on in the inside. So really work on yourself, accept the way you are. And that's my next point, which is self-love. Um, you know, we give a lot of ourselves away to the people that we love and care about, to the people that we think we're indebted to, you know, in our case, it's our employers or the teams that we're working in, or even, um, you know, as founders, the, the teams that you're building up. But without focusing on yourself, you're doing a great disservice to them. So whatever tickles your fancy, for me, for instance, I love tra reading trashy magazines. Someone would say that's something typically that I would never uh, talk about in the open, but that's what I do to relax myself. I love gossip. So whatever it is that tickles your fancy, do that. Don't beat yourself over it. And really just truly be kind to yourself. And that's when the kindness to others and to your work will also come out. Yeah, very fair, I think. Um, you know, I guess it's a very big part of accepting who are who we are, the, the self-love, and I guess that's where it all emerges from. But then where do we draw that line? You know, Anissa, I think she's very rightfully asked, uh, uh, how does one become a self-critic accurately? I mean, where is that boundary where you don't go overboard with your self-love and fail to see anything that you're uh, doing wrong, <laughs> overstepping? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think there's, uh, there's a difference between self-love and selfishness. Um, and I think we all kind of know what that border is for each of us. I, what's selfish for me might not be selfish for somebody else. But I think internally, we know when we're sort of crossing those lines and those borders. So I think, again, I come back to that analogy of an internal compass. Um, calibrate yourself with your internal compass regularly. I would say just take out an hour each week and really figure out what your core values are, what makes you, you. And, um, and then you'll know what's the difference between selfless and selfish. For a long time, I gave a lot, uh, either in my professional life or in my personal life, uh, without expecting a lot in return. But now that I have my son, I realize how much more important focusing on me has become. And my brother, Nitin has been one of the kindest advocates I've had for this, who's, who's actually told me many times, especially during that really troubling episode in my life, uh, where he just said, you've got to take care of yourself. You know, it's, it's not right what's happening to you. Um, so 
So I think, Anisha, you would probably know what your border is, how you want to cross it, if you want to cross it. But if not, then just calibrate your internal compass and really find out about your internal values, and then you'll know. Thank you, Prana. Uh, we're sort of close to the end of the webinar and uh, just wanted to remind everybody to take that survey and just to fill out those three short questions and tell us what we can do better next time. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Prana, to just keep you, you know, keep you going on talking about your life and, and giving us the sense of confidence um, and especially in, in celebration of this month of March. Uh, we need more inspiring women like you and especially with when we say tech and business and even journalism for that matter. Um, what, what would be some last thoughts, you know, if some afterthoughts you want to leave us with uh, today, something we can take back and just keep pondering over or probably compels us to start that journal? Yeah, I think um, really, you know, when you're thinking about your life at this present moment in time, and we're all on this journey called life, um, we're all going through issues either in our personal or professional life. Just remember that the one cheerleader that you'll always have is yourself. So no matter what um, the external world tells you uh, in terms of judgments related to your work, related to your appearance, related to your parenting skills, in my case, um, always remember that the one person that you'll have on your side, if you choose to let that person be on your side, is yourself. And it's taken me a long time to actually get myself on my side, if that makes any sense. And I feel that it's been a wasted opportunity because you have it in you. You don't need somebody else to tell you how good you are or how beautiful a person that you are. Um, it's just all inside. It's a matter of harnessing that positivity that all of us hold, ignoring the negativity that most of us face um, in our everyday lives, believing in ourselves that really whatever life throws at us, we will be able to achieve it no matter what having that determination that, you know, even when the going gets tough, there is going to be day, to, day fall after, you know, the nights and nights of, um, you know, misery that you might be going through, that there will be light at the end of the tunnel. So I think these are just some of the thoughts that I'd love to leave you all of with to reflect further on your own journey and to really just trust yourself and trust your gut because nobody else knows you well enough as much as you do. And if anyone would like to be in touch with me, please, my email is there on the link as well uh, or on the E27 profile for the contributors. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, and I'd love to continue this conversation. So thank you, Malie, for having me on as well. I, I really enjoyed this a lot. And a big thank you to everyone who joined us today, more importantly. Thank you, Prena. I think this was super stimulating, right? Um, I, I loved how you left us with Become your own cheerleader. I think that's what I'm going to take back. It's about bringing yourself uh, to your side. Uh, that one voice, I think we sort of just keep failing to listen and then still keep finding ourselves with the irony. Um, so that's what my key takeaway here is. And um, I've enjoyed speaking to you and I wish we could keep going on, but it's in Singapore, it's quite late already and I'm not going to keep anybody holding. But uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. Uh, we're going to continue to have these conversations and more similar ones uh, every month. Uh, feel free to tell us what, what are the topics you want to hear about, what are these challenges you're facing at work or in life. Um, join our Telegram channel. You can also refer to a lot of the articles on E27. And, and please take the, the survey. We've shared the link in the chat. Uh, we'll also send it out to you via email. And, and watch out for the podcast version of this uh, webinar if there's something you want to go back to. And I think uh, Prina's put out so many beautiful uh, thoughts for us to keep thinking over. And I'm sure there'll be a need for all of us to switch in back to listen to all of that and then keep reflecting. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And have a great evening and a great week ahead. Thank you, everyone.